Here on Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report, I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. Seymour Hersh is our guest for the hour, the award-winning investigative journalist based in Washington, D.C., has been a staff writer for The New Yorker, The New York Times, awarded the Pulitzer Prize as a freelancer in 1970 for his exposé of the My Lai Massacre in Vietnam. His new memoir is just out. It's called Reporter, a memoir. So, March 16, 1968, Sai. We have students, classes coming through here every week. Um, when you say me lie, the vast majority of the kids have never heard of it. In a nutshell, tell us what it is you exposed. And this is amazing. You did this as a freelance reporter. Where were you working? How did you find this story out? I had a little office in the National Press Building. I had been a reporter for the Associated Press covering the Pentagon, 66 and 67. I got in trouble there with, with the management. But I learned then, OJT, on-the-job training from officers. There's a lot of integrity in this service. There really is. A lot of people take the oath of office to the Constitution and mean it not to their general and not to, not to the president. And so I learned from those people uh, that it was a, a killing zone. It was just massacre. And I came away thinking, my God. And I started reading, of course, you have to, can't write, can't, you got to read before you write. So I was ready to believe a tip in 69 that there had been a terrible massacre. The thing is, I didn't know how bad it was until I got into it. What happened is a group of American kids, to their credit, they were just country boys. Um, in those days, the kids in the street, we had more, more African Americans than in, in the population, more Hispanics um, than the population, a lot of rural kids, American kids from, 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 the, from small villages across the country. And we're not talking about big city kids in this company, a few, but very few. And they were told how bad the communists were. They were told one day they were going to, tomorrow you're going to, they've been in the country for three months lost about 30 percent of their people through snipers. They'd fall into pits with uh, sticks with poison on them, I mean, you know, horrible stuff. And so they began to hate, and they were allowed to hate. And there was a lot of ignorance about the society, about the culture of Vietnam. And, um, and they, had, they were just uh, 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 in one of the worst divisions of the war, America division. The way the war was, you could do anything you wanted, kill people, because it was always seen as a violation of rules and not as a criminal act. So that's how they covered up stuff. So they were ready to go. They were ready. They were told they were, they were going to meet the enemy for the first time in three months of being in country. They'd never seen the enemy. They just were shot at. And, um, and they went into this village of about 500 people, possibly more, and they expected to see the enemy there. The intelligence, as it always is, was bad. There was no, the 48th North Vietnamese Division was nowhere near the place. That's what they thought. And instead of meeting the enemy, there were just families, women and children and old men, and so they began to murder them. They put them in ditches, and they raped, they killed, they threw babies up. I, this was hard for me to, to even, in the, the first year, and ca caught them on uh, bayonets. I mean, and some of the stuff I kept out of the initial story was just so awful. And you initially heard that there was a lieutenant uh, uh, being uh, being charged with uh, some of these atrocities, and you and uh, talk about how you tracked them down. Actually, what I first heard, it came from a, a, a wonderful man named Jeff Cowan, who was just out of law school, who was then in a, 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 a he was just in a new uh, public policy group, so a social law firm that one of the first set up in Washington. And he heard this tip, and he figured I might do it. He didn't know where to go. And um, I started chasing it. He said it was an enlisted man went, went crazy. And so what I thought it was for my, I, I'd read the Russell Tribunal, which everybody poo-pooed, but the Russell Tribunal, Bertrand Russell Tribunal, published, I guess, in 65 or 66, had a long section on stuff going on in the war that was amazing. And I found one of the guys that testified, so I knew it was true. And so <laughs> I, I thought something bad happened. I thought maybe they threw rockets into a village. They used to have sometimes, even in as early as 65, they'd go in a village and there wouldn't be any enemy there, and the soldiers would be frustrated. And the officers would say to the guys in tanks and the guys with machine guns, you have a mad minute. So they just shoot up everything in the village. I'm, literally, that's what's going on, according to the Russians. And it was true. So I knew that. What I didn't know, I mean, <laughs> We were censored in World War II. We all know that. We didn't see the photographs. We didn't know how bad it was. We didn't know how both sides treated each other. We were, so I didn't know either. And as I'm doing the story, I'm learning it's not just some bombing or some mad moment. It's a group of soldiers spending a day putting people in ditches, shooting them at will. 
There was one scene they had maybe 80 people in a ditch and a young man named Paul Meadlow, who I interviewed. I found him. And um, um, he, he, they sprayed bullets into it, and some mother, I didn't share the story for a long time, some mother had tucked a baby. Everybody was killed, they thought, maybe, as I say, 80 people. There's a famous photograph of the ditch. She kept a little two-year-old ba baby under, protected. And about 10 minutes after they'd done the shooting, they were having lunch, their K ration, sitting there around the ditch. And this little boy, full of other people's blood, called up, crawled up to the top of the ditch, keening, screaming, and began to run away when he got to the top. And Lieutenant Kelly said to Paul Meadler, who had done most of the shooting, a farm boy from a place called New Goshen, Indiana, you know, had barely gotten through high school and was taken. The Army lowered his standards very quickly in the war because they didn't want bright kids there because they would talk about what's going on. I, I say that seriously, seriously. That was the mode of McNamara, who was a psychotic liar. I figured that out when I was even in the Pentagon. Anyway, so this kid's running away, and Callie says to Meadlow, plug him. And Meadlow, who'd been shooting in the ditch, couldn't shoot one. So Callie, the great, the great man of the world, ran up behind him with his—the officers had a, a, smaller, a smaller rifle and a carbine, and shot him in the back of the head, blew off his head. The baby. The, the child. baby. In front of his own shoulders. I'm learning this, I say. I, I want to turn to Go Private ahead. First Class Paul Meadlow. Speaking about his involvement in the My Lai Massacre, in 1969, he spoke to CBS's Mike Wallace on national television about what happened. Well, I might have killed about uh, 10 or 15 of them. Men, women, and children. Men, women, and children. And babies. And babies. Why did you do it? Why did I do it? Because I felt like I was ordered to do it. Well, at the time, I felt like I was doing the right thing. Or I did. You're married. Right. Children? Two. How can a father of two young children shoot babies? I don't know. It's just one of them things. Paul Meadlow saying it was just one of them things, speaking on 60 Minutes in 1969. You— and Then you had some involvement in getting oh him there? Oh, my God. He was—I wrote—what happened is— I got the tip. I found my way to Fort Benning, where Cali. I found my way to Cali. I had a. Do I saw a document in which he was initially accused of a hundred killing 109 or 111 Oriental human beings, Oriental human beings, and I remember going nuts. Does that mean one Oriental equals how many whites, how many blacks? And I did do something. The one thing I did that made a friend of life for me with Mel Laird, the Secretary of Defense, a congressman who was then Secretary of Defense, who was appalled, too, by this, I did go to his people, to him, actually, pretty much directly, and said, I'm going to take this out, because this is so friggin' racist that I, I, I think any, any American soldier walking down a street in the South Vietnam could be executed for having done that. So I did take it out. I didn't write that. Oriental human beings is what they wrote. Oh, in, you said you're going to take it out. You're going to omit in. it from the story. I just took out the word oriental. I said, I just, you can't do, you, you can't be that dumb. You can't be that crazily racist. And it was a, to charge him with that. Anyway, that's just a sideshow. I did it because I just thought too many American boys who had nothing to do with it would be executed, but just shot at random. It would create so much anger. And, um, uh, I don't. I'm not. I don't second guess that. I mean, it was bad enough what I had. Believe me, what they did, um, and I, I found Kelly, and <laughs> nobody wanted it. I not only been a uh, correspondent for the Pentagon at the AP. I'd, I'd worked, you'd been Eugene McCarthy's uh, press secretary. Wrote a lot of speeches for him. I'd been. No, I knew all the reporters knew me. They had to deal with me. I also uh, freelance and between '67 and '69. By this time, I had maybe written a dozen articles, including three or four for the New York Times Sunday Magazine on all sorts of stuff. So they knew me. You know what? It, when I, even when I got to the New York Times in '72 later. Um, a, 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 Appropriately, you know, they hired me. I was at the New Yorker then, and they hired me away. Even then, it was there were some stories I did that what they wanted me to do is maybe somebody else should do it first, <laughs> and then they'll do the but second day story. You went to the New York Times. They didn't want. Uh, the well, story. no, I didn't go near the New York Times because they would. Steal. I thought I was worried about taking it over. I went to uh, people I'd worked for. I worked for Life. I had a commitment from Life magazine. Uh, I had Look Magazine was talking to me. I went to the New York Review of Books. Bob Silvers wanted to write it. And I was a friend of Izzy Stone's. Izzy Stone had picked up on um, Izzy Stone had some sort of—I'd been a reporter for the Pentagon for only about a month or two. 
and he saw something in my stories that made him. He used to go out Sunday morning to the major out of city newspaper stand at six o'clock in the morning and buy 20 papers. And one morning, I never, I, I knew who he was through my mother in law, who had been a subscriber for years. <laughs> one morning, about 6 30, I was just newly married. We'd been partying on a Sunday morning. The call comes, and it's Izzy about I, before seven o'clock saying, Have you seen page 19 of the Philadelphia Inquirer today? <laughs> what? So we became friends, and he would, we would take walks. And I will tell you, if you ever want a tutorial from anybody in the world, you want it from Izzy Stone. The whole idea of reading, all he did was read everything. He did it all by simply brain power. He's amazing. Anyway, and so he was a mentor. So I, and he, I couldn't get anybody to buy it. Bob Silvers wanted to do it. He was going to remake the magazine. I came to him late and put it. I'll never forget this. And I'd done, they bought, I published a book on chemical and biological warfare that they had syndicated in 68 or so. They'd done, they had been friendly to me. I'd done pieces for him. And I liked him. I liked the magazine. And much more radical. And what happened is he wanted me to put a paragraph in after the, he was going to run on the cover, the story. I just wrote a straightforward AP story. Lieutenant Carley did this and this. He murdered this. And he wanted a paragraph saying, this shows why the war is bad. And I said, Bob, <laughs> no, the story tells why the war is bad. And we had a fight. I actually pulled it out because I, and people ask me, one of the things they ask me about, how could you do that? Here's a public place. Because the story deserved to be just there for sure, everybody. Who published it? Uh, a little anti-war news service, the dispatch news service, which people don't understand here. They had correspondents in Vietnam who knew Vietnamese, and they were quite good service. And I was doing some stuff for them because I really respected it. I gave it to them, thought, who knows? And somehow they got it on 35 front pages, the story. The American press was open to the story, and um, it was 1969. It wouldn't be now. Some papers would run it, and some papers wouldn't because of the division. It was a different time. And, and you won the Pulitzer Prize. Well, but I kept sure. on going. I but, found I found Meadlo. Uh, I I I I got a company register. M e a d l o. I knew he was somewhere in Indiana. I spent I don't know ten hours calling every phone directory in the state till I finally found a M e a d l o in a place called New Goshen. And I remember flying from Salt Lake City to Chicago to Indianapolis, getting a car. And when I got there. It's a, uh, this kid that had, he had yeah. killed these people. Let me just tell you this story. The next day he had his leg blown off and he kept on screaming. This is what made everybody remember this. His leg was blown off and he'd done all the shooting. And he said to me, Callie, he was talking about Lieutenant Callie, had ordered him to do it. He said, God has punished me, Lieutenant Callie, and God will punish you. So I find this kid. It's a rundown farm in this rural area of, uh, near Terre Haute, near the Indiana state line, or in, in Indiana, near the Illinois state line. And it's an old farmhouse. There's chickens running all over. The coops aren't attending. His mother, I'd called earlier and gotten his mother, and she confirmed that was the boy, Paul, who lost his leg. I go out there. Here comes this farm woman. This is a hardtack place. She's probably 50, looks 70, and I came out, and I, I had a little ratty suit on, and came in a car, rent a car, and I said, I'm the guy that called. Is Paul, uh, can I see him? She said, well, he lives in that separate house there. I don't know what he's going to do. And then this woman said to me, this woman who didn't read newspapers, didn't watch much, much news, she said to me, I gave them a good boy, and they sent me back a murderer. I mean, are you kidding? And then I went in. And what I did with him, he had a leg, and I spent the first 20 minutes asking him to show me the, the stump and how did they treat him. And then he started talking. And then my, I had a friend who was working with the dispatch, David Opes, who later became Wilbur and Bernstein's literary agent. Um, in, well, he was the guy packaging the story and somehow selling him. And um, he called up CBS, and they said, bring him here. And he agreed to come with his wife. Uh, he flew from, from we, we went to Indianapolis, and he flew to New York. And he wanted, it was expiation. And he went on TV, and Mike Wallace, who's tough as nails, asked him, he asked him five times in that interview, and babies again, he kept on saying, and babies. And Mike was a very tough dude, and he got him there, and they, first they were just interviewing him. Um, they were practicing, and he asked them a question, he began to talk, and he said, stop, put on the cameras, and the kid just did it. And that turned the story, because at that point, he's on television. It's not dispatch news selling stories to everybody for 100 bucks, And it changed America. And here's what also killed me. After that was the third story I did. I did two more. It was a Thursday, I think. It was on Walter Cronkite. Remember, we had, we had CBS News was against the war. We had something. We had a, a network news agency that actually took a stand on something. 
I mean, I don't know what they're doing with this, the Mexico thing, but I'm sure they're being objective. <laughs> anyway, all, there's no objectivity in this one. Um, and so what happened is that Sunday, about 10 papers had their correspondents who had been in Vietnam that told this story about what of a massacre they witnessed. So we're dealing with self-censorship to a degree, and I learned a lot. You know what I learned? I learned I can handle them. I can run them. They could be mine.